Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful, where your dreams of abundance flow. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glory. Blessed be your name when the sun is shining down on me, when the world's all as it should be. Blessed be your name. Blessed be your name on the road marked with suffering, for there's pain in the offering. Blessed be your name. Every blessing you pour out, I'll turn back to praise. When the darkness closes in, Lord, still I will say, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your name. Blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glory. Darkness seems 
What a wonderful name. What a wonderful name. Jesus. Jesus, we love you. Death could not hold you. The veil torn before you. You silent
Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your word. Thank you for speaking to us, for encouraging us. Thank you for saving us.
Father God, you are great and awesome and holy. Lord, you are worthy of all praise and honor. Amen. Hallelujah, Jesus, you are great. Lord, we thank you for this time this morning of worship and being in your presence and surrendering to you, Father God. Lord, there's no better place for us to be than at your feet, Father God. Thank you for allowing us to be here. Thank you for being here this Amen. morning, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for being present in this place, Father God. Lord, you are so wonderful, so worthy of all praise, Father. Lord, we do come before you this morning and lift up our cares and our burdens and our worries unto you as well. Lord, you know what each and every one of us are dealing with. You know what each and every one of us have walked through this past week and, and what's ahead. And Lord, we come to you today and we ask for forgiveness. We, we thank you for deliverance and we pray for overcoming victory all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Lord, this morning I do think specifically of Candy's friend. Her son Trevor was in a, some sort of an accident this week. I don't know all the details, but Lord, You know his condition right now. In the hospital fighting for his life. Lord, I pray that You would minister to Trevor. Wherever he's at, whatever hospital he's in, Lord, that You would reach down and touch him that You would heal His flesh, that You would give the doctors wisdom, that You would take away that, that bleeding in His brain, that You would help His heart to function as it needs to function, and that You would bring wholeness to His life in the name of Jesus Christ. Let Your peace, let Your joy, let Your comfort surround that family today, Father God. Encourage them, Lord. Father, for every need that's represented here in this body, for every need that's represented by those watching, Lord, would You touch them? Would You minister to them? Would You speak to them as only You can in the exact way that they need to hear from You today? Lord, every one of us is unique. Every one of us are in a different place. Mentally, socially, physically, emotionally but You know exactly where we're at and what we need. God, be in control today. Overwhelm Your people today with Your power, with Your hope, with Your presence, Father God. Lord, we give ourselves to You. We, we give this service, this day, this everything about this to You. And pray, Father God, for You to continue to move and minister in Jesus name amen this morning we are going to jump right into scripture here pretty quickly so I invite you to open up to Mark chapter 5 that's where we're going to be reading from this morning <clears throat> whether you have your physical word or your digital word feel free to open to Mark 5 you'll find there the heading of this scripture is about a demon-possessed man and the deliverance of that individual. Once we read through this scripture together this morning, we are going to talk just a tiny little bit 
about this idea of deliverance. But there's something else in the Scripture we're going to look at this morning. We are going to talk about the three different ways that this man was treated in the course of this Scripture. So let's get to it. Mark chapter 5, starting at verse 1. They went across the lake to the region of the garrisons. When Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an impure spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills he would cry out and cut himself with stones. When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send him out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs. Allow us to go into them. He gave them permission and the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs. The herd, about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and they were drowned. Those tending the pigs ran off and reported this to the town and the countryside. And the people went out to see what had happened. When they came to Jesus, they saw the man who had been possessed by a legion of demons sitting there, dressed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. Those who had seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and told them about the pigs as well. Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. As Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who had been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So the man went away and began to tell in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. Three of the four Gospels record this encounter with the demon-possessed men at the tombs. Matthew talks about there being two men that were demon-possessed, while Mark and Luke focus in on the one individual that addressed Jesus and talked directly to Jesus. The first thing we're going to look at here is actually a little bit of a warning. We're going to talk just a tiny bit about this idea of demonic possession and demonic oppression. Because we need to understand something this morning. The two of them, possession and oppression, are very real. They are not some Old Testament issue of days gone by. But still, here, today, in 2021, demonic influence in the lives of people is very real. We live in the United States of America. We live in a a first world nation. We live in a land of a comfortable environment. 
we don't think about the spiritual the way that so many others around the world do. Too often, far too often, even us as believers in Jesus Christ laugh at this idea of demonic influence or demonic oppression. We make TV shows about it. We make movies about it. All in the name of entertainment. And i got to tell you, that is a very, very, very dangerous place to be. A very dangerous attitude to have. Demonic possession and demonic oppression is not something that we should be joking around about or taking lightly. We're not going to unpack everything that there is related to spiritual warfare and, and demonic influence today. But we do need to understand the reality of it, the truth of it. This Scripture that we read is just one example of it. One example of a man being set free from that demonic control. And it clearly outlines the authority that Jesus has over those demons, over that legion of demons that this man or these men were dealing with. It also shows the permission that demons need to do anything, including where they are able to go, what they are able to be a part of or not a part. They need permission. Jesus allowed the demons to go into those pigs. They couldn't go on their own. They had to get His okay for that to happen. And when that took place, I know this is going to maybe shock some of us a little bit, Jesus was, was so, showing us something there. He was showing us the importance of human life over and above absolutely anything else. Now, I have had pets most all my life. I love my pets. I, I'm a dog fan. I love dogs. They're they're God's cre creation. I understand that. But there is no animal on this planet that is as important as a human being. And God makes that clear by setting these men free and allowing those evil spirits to invade those pigs. I don't know if the people in that town were more interested in the pigs or if they were more interested in the money that the pigs would bring them but the pigs were not as important as the human souls that jesus was saving nothing is more important to him than the eternity of a man mankind by the way there's certainly a lot more to talk about when it comes to demonic possession and spiritual warfare again we can't talk about all of that this morning we see that these individuals were delivered <clears throat> but we'll have to cover more of that at another time today we're going to look as i mentioned earlier about three different perspectives three different viewpoints three different things we see here about how these men were treated and we're going to start by looking at how these men were treated by Satan. How did he treat these individuals? Clearly, Scripture tells us that they were demon-possessed. So we have a baseline here. They've been, they are in the control of Satan himself. And in fact, Jesus even says in his own words when he got out of a boat, out of the boat, it says that the man with the evil spirit came from the tombs. So clearly, uh, a demonic issue here, no question about that. It is assumed that both of these men acted similarly. Even though Mark and Luke only focus in on the one man that Jesus was having a discussion with, it's assumed that both men that Matthew talks about are in the same position or a very similar position. What do we know about these men? They lived among the tombs. How many of us would choose to make that our home? 
They lived among the tombs. They could not be chained or restrained in any way. They lived naked. Stripped not only of their clothing, but stripped also of their dignity. They were completely naked in how they dwelled among the tombs. They were separated from anybody else. No friends, no family, no acquaintances, nobody else to be with them or to spend time with them. If they came in contact with somebody along the way, they caused fear. They caused panic. They caused chaos in the lives of other people, whether it was the people of the town or, or whoever that came into their presence. Nobody was looking to spend any time with them or visit with them or comfort them. That, folks, is how Satan treats people. He uses them as objects for his own agenda. Satan sees people, all people, every person as useless pawns. That's how he views them. Pawns that he can use to disrupt others, to disrupt plans, to disrupt groups, towns, events, even, dare I say, churches. He sees people as pawns. He treats them as humiliated creatures, unworthy of any kind of respect whatsoever. He does His best to isolate people, to keep them on their own, destroying relationships, destroying families, destroying marriages. Ultimately, if we were to think about it or or spend any time reviewing it, we would most likely find that well, not most likely, we would find that Satan is to blame for all of the broken homes and broken marriages and broken relationships that we see all around us every day. His desire is to destroy. That's it. That's his desire. We don't know what these particular men were like prior to this condition that we see them in. Certainly, they were not perfect by any means. But what we see them is at this point where they have been stripped away from everything. Everything that any one of us would consider important in life. There's no discussion there of shelter or home or food. Or obviously, they have no clothing. Obviously, no money. They're away from their family, their church. They have Everything has been removed from their lives. And they are reduced to living much more like beasts than they are like people. Now this description of them might seem incredibly graphic to us. But honestly, this is about as basic as it gets. Scripture sums it up for us very clearly. John calls Satan a thief. A thief. And in John 10.10 we read this. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy and destroy. That is the enemy's singular agenda for any person that has or will ever exist on this earth. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter who you know. It doesn't matter what influence you think you have. Satan has one agenda in mind for every single person. And that is to steal away their lives. Steal away anything he possibly can. 
money, health, relationships, esteem, anything. He wants to steal it away. He wants to kill the very being that God has created in His image. And He wants to destroy any hope of any restoration that we might be trying to hold on to. To steal, to kill, and to destroy. Jesus, speaking of Satan in John 44, says this, He is a liar and the father of lies. There is nothing that the evil one will not do to trick or manipulate or deceive people so that he can destroy them. Because that is his agenda. And the crazy thing is he does it all while acting like he's doing us a favor. He's a deceiver. He's a manipulator. He makes us think that things are good when his singular agenda is anything but good. The enemy is subtle. He is tricky. He sweet talks us. He tells us what we want to hear. He makes promises that he cannot and will not keep. Has no intention of keeping. As beautiful as they may sound, don't trust in those promises that the enemy whispers in your ear. Because his plan is to steal and kill and destroy the very life that he is in fact manipulating. And no one is out of his touch. No one is, is too grown up or, or too mature, too far away for him to deal with. He is no respecter of people or positions of any kind. He will do whatever he can to find that tiniest little crack and worm his way in to someone's life. So the next time you are fighting temptation, the next time you're battling against those appealing yet wrong desires, remember who it is that is trying to push his way in to your life. And remember what his ultimate plan for your life is. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. We can never underestimate the destructive agenda of the enemy. We must always be aware, regardless of what he says, that he has only one agenda, and that's to destroy life. These men were at rock bottom, so to speak. That's what we like to call it, right? They were at the bottom of, of their existence, at the bottom of their life. Let's see how people, how society treated these men. I don't think any of us would ever question the fact that these men needed help in some way. I, 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 I can't imagine they, they went from from uh, acceptable societal individuals to the position they were in overnight. I'm sure it was a, a downward spiral that they went through. At one point, they probably had what we would consider normal lives and yet somehow ended up in the condition that they are in at this point. What help did society give them? What help did the community around them offer them? Did their neighbors step in? Did their friends reach out? Did their family give a hand? What did society do to provide for these individuals? According to the text that we read, they were rejected. They were isolated. They were chained and, and put into bondage. 
What did society do to help these individuals? I got to tell you, their society's ability to do anything is incredibly limited. Incredibly limited. There are some good programs. There are some good things within society. Yes, absolutely. There are people that can help. There are organizations that can help. There are counselors that can help. Society does have some positive influence for people. But hear me loud and clear, none of them can replace Jesus Christ. None of them can offer what Jesus alone offers. In this particular case, society helped by casting them out. By giving up on them. By chaining them and avoiding them at all circumstances. That was the help that society gave to these two individuals. They assumed it was better to simply push them out of the way so that things would be better for them as a, as a town, as a whole. You know, even with all the, the beautiful, wonderful, scientific advancements we have in our nation and in our world, all the consistent breakthroughs that there are in things, society simply cannot cope with man cannot cope with man on any level, anywhere even close to what the Creator can do. And today, in 2021, we deal with a huge problem in this nation anyhow. And that's self-preservation. Self-preservation appears to be far more important in this text than reaching out or helping anybody else. It is that self-serving agenda of the day. What's in it for me? What good do I get out of it? How does it help me? In what way will I move forward? In all? That's the self-serving agenda that our society functions in today. Let's look at a third perspective this morning. How did Jesus see these men? How did He treat these men? He saw them the same way that He sees any one of us. Hundreds and hundreds of years ago, He dealt with these individuals that were demon-possessed in the tombs, but He saw them the same way He's seen any of us as a lost, sinful people in need of a Savior. Jesus could have done anything He wanted to do when He met those men on the shore. He could have said, go away from Me. You're too far gone. I can't help you. You're not in the right place. You're of no value. He could have said any of those things. Honestly, He could have landed somewhere else and not even encountered these individuals if He so chose to. But He didn't. He met these men right where they were at. Right where their need was. Right in the sinful condition that they were in. In that low, rock-bottom place that we talked about a moment ago. They were seeped in sin and confusion. And what did Jesus do? He showed them love. Compassion. Mercy. The very same thing He shows us. The very same thing He showed each of His disciples day after day. While these men were assumedly at the lowest point in their lives, Jesus did not give up on them. He restored them. He spoke to them. He loved and encouraged them. Ultimately, He delivered them from their horrible condition. Just as He has done to every one of us. 
Now I know you're sitting there saying, well, I've never been possessed by a legion of demons. Maybe that's the case. But He still delivered you. He still delivered me. He took me out of the old lifestyle that I was living and put me on the right path. He restored me. Made me whole. Why? Because that's who Jesus is. A comforter. A healer. A deliverer. A redeemer. A restorer. That's how He treats people. He is everything to all people. Right where they are at. Right at the moment that they need Him most. Because His agenda is all about restoration and wholeness. Forgiveness and love. These men were being destroyed by Satan. And Jesus set them free. Guess what, folks? Every one of us were on that same path of destruction. And it's only by the grace of God that we are set free. Thank Him that you are set free today or beg Him to set you free today. One of the two. This Scripture absolutely deals with demonic possession. We've talked about that already. and there, there, That picture of that is very clear in the Scripture that we read. But there's this overarching lesson here that freedom can be obtained through Jesus Christ. And through Him alone, regardless of where you're at in life, regardless of what position you find yourself in, nothing, no matter what this world, no matter what society says or does, nothing in our lives is beyond the redeeming reach of Jesus Christ. I don't care who you are, where you've been, what sin you've committed, or how gross it might seem, nothing is beyond the redemptive reach of Jesus Christ. Satan comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. Society, try as it may, falls short of helping man in his true condition and chooses only self-service in the end. It's only Jesus who can meet us right where we're at in our current condition and set us free with unconditional love, with healing and restoration, with grace and mercy. At the end of the Scripture we read, the one man that was delivered wanted to go with Jesus. He wanted to spend time with Jesus. And Jesus says, no, I don't want you to come with me. I want you to stay right here and be a testimony for what's happened to the people around you. Because they need to hear what's been done in your life. Obviously, those are my words. Scripture didn't give us all of those. In the last verse it says, So the man went away and began to tell the people in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. Amazed because he was set free? Yes. But amazed because of all the things that Jesus had done for him. He went home and he testified to his friends and his family. He went home and he stood up in church and said, i got to tell you what Jesus did for me. And he told people about how Jesus set him free. Not how society gave him a second chance, but how Jesus set him free. There's a, an interesting reaction here by society that we didn't talk about yet either and we're not going to dwell on this but i want us to look at this for just a second in verse 17 
when the people saw all that had happened, when they saw this demon-possessed man dressed and sitting in his right mind and how he had been delivered, when they saw all that, the people said, please leave. Speaking to Jesus, please leave. They weren't interested in what Jesus had done. They were more concerned about the pigs or the money or whatever it is that was on their mind. They weren't interested. Again, a sad state of the condition of society. <clears throat> One more thing we're going to note just real quick again this morning. I want you to realize something about what took place in this event today. There was one singular purpose wrapped around this whole thing. Did you happen to notice it? From beginning to end, Jesus had one plan. See, He had just arrived at that spot from the other side of the lake. He was on a boat with the disciples. They landed on shore at the tombs. And this man, these men, came and talked with Jesus right there, right where they had landed, in that spot. Jesus talked with them. He shared with them. He healed them. He delivered them. He sent the evil demonic spirits away. And then Jesus got back in the boat and left. He didn't go into the town. He really didn't have a whole lot of conversation with anybody else. Jesus had one agenda. It was to land in that spot at that moment to meet those men and to restore them. And then he left. His work there was done. But He changed their lives forever. He showed them love. He delivered them. He restored them. And that was His singular agenda for going to that point and then leaving and going about ministry yet again. See, God's agenda is always for us. John 12.32 says, When I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to Myself. His sole purpose in coming to this earth was to redeem and restore mankind. That was His agenda. That is still his agenda. That will always be His agenda. Restore mankind unto Himself. Nobody else has that same agenda. Only our God. Father, thank You for saving us, for restoring us, for healing us, for making us whole. Thank You that your plan, your purpose, your agenda is for each and every one of us individually. Lord, you care about us. You care about our eternity. You care about our souls. You care about our existence. And everything you have done is to restore that relationship between us and you. Lord, I pray if anyone is, is listening to this and they, they, they have not experienced this restoration, God, would You draw upon them right here, right now. God, in an overwhelming way, would You pull on their heartstrings that they might see and hear and know that it's You and You alone, Father God, that loves them. Nothing this world, nothing this society has to offer can, can equal in any way what You want for them. God, I pray that You would help every individual understand the destructive nature of the enemy and his deceitful agenda. God, help us to stand firm against that. 
Lord, if we have indeed put our hope in You, Lord, help us to walk with You daily. Lord, a little more every day. Help us to indeed fear less and to walk closer to You. God, You you have only the best in store for us. You have only the best in mind for us. It may not go exactly as we plan or be just what we think it should be, but You have the best in mind for us. Your sole agenda is to restore us. God, I thank You for that. I thank You for Your Word. I pray that we would learn to walk closer and closer to You. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Unending love, amazing.